pick up a telephone and call mom and uh, no, not while she's in the service, Tristan. Um, so that's about all the Mother's Day you're going to get out of me. I'm sorry, I'm just not a Hallmark card preacher. And so we're just going to continue in our study through the book of Acts, chapter 13, if you'd open your Bibles there. And um, in the book of Acts, chapter 13, we continue in our study. Uh, we... We ended uh, in Acts chapter 13 and verse number 5 uh, last week, but I, I do want to um, kind of backtrack and uh, speak to you on this topic, a church that's engaged in missions. Last week, uh, we spoke about a, a church with a heart for missions, and, and what, what were some of the things that were important when you're looking for a church that's on mission? What are the things that God uses? And I lifted out three specific things for you. One is that there needs to be a spiritual leadership. We spoke about the importance, how God uses men as he calls them to lead the body of Christ. Secondly, we said it, not only should they be a spiritual leadership, but they should be sensitive to the spiritual leading. In other words, they should be spirit-led and then the third thing that we had mentioned with regards to this passage is that they should be engaged, uh, or the church as a whole should be engaged in a spiritual labor. In other words, the work of missions, the evangelization of the, the world is a spiritual labor, although we do participate in material things or physical things, uh, we are in a spiritual battle and it is a labor of a spiritual nature. And so I pick up in our reading Acts chapter 13. I'm going to read from verse 1, but we'll deal all the way down to verse uh, 12 if the Lord would allow today. And Acts 13 verse 1. Now they were in the church at Antioch, Prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And so, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, as, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for, for that is what his, uh, the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist broke, and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, and when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. A church engaged in missions. What is this and what is important elements to that? Well, I want to go through a few things. And first and foremost, to understand missions, we need to understand that the, there is always a commissioner. In other words, there is one that commissions to missions, and he has commissioned each of us. He has called us into the business of proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, you may immediately balk against that and say, well, I'm not leaving the, my comfortable home and going to India, or I'm not going to suffer for Jesus in Hawaii, or whatever it is. Uh, I am very comfortable where I am. I have not been called to leave the country. Uh, that's fine. I understand that. I pray that when God really calls you to do that, that you will step out in obedience and do that. But let it not be misunderstood this morning that everyone is called to this one thing, and it is this, the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, not everybody does that vocationally or, or does that uh, as their only uh, uh, employment, if you want, and I hate to use that word, uh, but each one is called to missions. The mission begins right at your next door neighbor's front door. The mission begins in uh, Ingalls up the road. The mission begins when we walk up into town and we see people. It begins with our friends. It begins with our family. We are all called to be on mission for Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the commissioner. It is he that commissions us and calls us to do the work. I came across the following uh, quotes that I, I really wanted to read to you today, and I felt like they uh, made an impression upon my heart in the importance of missions and the work of the Holy Spirit. The missionary to India and Persia, Henry Martin, once said this, The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of missions. The nearer we get to Him the more intensely, intensely missionary we must become. Uh, it was James Stewart in his book, The Holy Spirit, The Divine Executive, that said the following, The divine executive is the instigator of all true evangelical activities. He is the commander-in-chief of the army of Christ. Furthermore, Stuart said, true evangelism is God's chosen vessels working in cooperation with the Holy Spirit for the completion of the body of Christ. Listen to that. That is an amazing statement. True evangelism is God's chosen vessels, that's you and I, working in in cooperation, that's very important. In other words, it's not something we do on our own, by our own power, our own strength, and in our own way. But we are working in cooperation with the Holy Spirit for the purpose of the completion of the body of Christ. Listen, God is at work building His kingdom. God is at work building the body, equipping the body, and He has chosen to use you and to use me in order to do just that. To call people into the kingdom. And so any church that wants to be engaged in missions, first and foremost, needs to understand that there is a commissioner. That God himself is the commissioner. This is a divine task. Well, where do you find this in Scripture? Well, Acts chapter 8, sorry, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 is really uh, the key to knowing that. Remember Jesus speaking, he said this, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he said that you would receive power and you would be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's the Holy Spirit that not only commissions, but it is also He that empowers. Well, here we see in our passage Him commissioning. Look to verse 2. While they, this is at the church in Antioch, were worshiping the Lord and they were fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. God the Holy Spirit sending out missionaries to reach the world for Him. Do not for one moment think that you are by happenstance in Rutherford County, 
Polk County, Henderson County. We're like the Tri-City County right here. So we've got people from every county in this room probably. But I want you to know this. Don't think that by happenstance you're living there. We are where God has placed us at this moment in time to make a difference for him today. I find that as a believer, many times I'm looking to the future, asking the Lord, what are you going to do with me in the future? Instead of asking this question, God, what are you doing right now? Sometimes we live with our eyes so fixed on the future that the future never comes and the present eludes us. How I encourage you today, church, to be engaged in missions. That God, through the work of His Holy Spirit, is commissioning us and His commission is to enter into His work. You'll notice it says here, set apart for Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I I have called them. This is a spiritual labor. This is not a work that was called out by man for man to do. This is God's work, and God accomplishes his work in his way, and one of the ways that he does that is through you and I, being willing to be obedient to our commissioner, our commander-in-chief. To stay in step with him as we march into the future. Could it be there's a man or woman in this room? You've been commissioned. We all have been commissioned. But maybe there's a man or woman in this room that uh, you sense the call into the ministry. You know that God's called you. And you're just plain disobedient. Could I say it's time for you to step up and step out. And be obedient to what God's called you and to trust Him with the outcome. Wow, you're pretty upfront today, aren't you? I, I always am, especially when God has said it and not me. I want you to know that when God has called someone, that He has put that divine calling upon your life, you need to be obedient and trust Him because He's the commissioner. It's not the work of the church to commission. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. But the church plays a role in that. Look at this. Verse number three. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Well, who's the they? Well, that is the church. Where's the church? Well, that church that's being spoken of is in Antioch. And so here the church in Antioch are obedient to the commissioner and they are here formally laying their hands upon these men, recognizing or affirming the call upon their lives and pledging their support to these men and sending these men out for the work that was given. Well, the church sent them. No, no, the church worked in cooperation with the commissioner. Look at verse 4. So... Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, not sent out by the church. Yes, the church cooperated with the commissioner in sending them out on commission, but it was the work of the Holy Spirit. Listen, can you think of a greater privilege than to be called by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to enter into a cooperation with him and to work for his glory? Uh, there are many of us that live with our eye on some great job or some aspiration. Uh, you may uh, have grown up and, and this question's always asked of, of our children. So what are you going to be when you grow up? Anyone ever asked you that question when you were small? I'm still asking myself that question. What am I going to be when I grow up? Right? Let me tell you. It's very few times that you will ever hear someone say, I, I want to go and stand all alone and plant a banner for Jesus Christ. And even if I have to christen that banner with my blood, I will stand firm for Jesus. Have you ever heard a kid say that? I want to be a policeman. I, I, I want to be a fireman. I, I, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a, well, well what about, I, I want to be a martyr for Christ. Is there a greater call than the call to suffer for Jesus Christ, I would say to you, no. It's absolutely worth it because there is no greater master.
than the King of kings and Lord of lords. Step up and step out. Listen to the commissioner. Engage in his commission. Notice it says in the scripture, set them aside for the work that I have called them to. For set them aside for me. This is being set aside for God. Notice as they go out, look at the commission. So verse number four says, they went down to Seleucia. So now I'm trying to give you this mind picture. Antioch is on the Orontes River. Um, and the Orontes River runs down into the Mediterranean, about 16 miles up the Orontes River. You have this place called Antioch. Antioch is the third greatest city in the Roman Empire. There is only um, Rome, uh, Alexandria, and then Antioch uh, that, that is greater. And so now they go down the Orontes River and they get to their port city uh, on the Mediterranean and it is called Seleucia. There they are going to board a ship and they're going to go straight across to this island uh, called uh, the island of Cyprus. And it is there that we know that Barnabas came from there. Uh, we even know that not only Barnabas came from there, but Lucius came from there. And so they're going to Barnabas's home area. And when they get there, this is what encourages me. Verse 5, when they arrive at Salamis, which is the port, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Notice the task never changes. The task never changes. You'll notice it did not say they, they got to the island and, and decided to open up a slushy company because it was so hot on that island and, and they wanted to make snow cones to tell about Jesus. Now I've got no problem with taking care of the physical needs but God primarily works through the ministry of his word. Faith cometh from hearing and hearing from the word. I'm not saying we should not support missions or go on missions where we are building a, 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 a building or, or we're going to feed the hungry or any of those things. We need to do those things. But if we do those things and neglect the one primary thing, which is the word of God, we've done nothing but become a human, humanitarian organization. And they go and they do exactly what they were doing. Right there in Antioch, we know they've been teaching for many years. They leave there, go to Seleucia. From Seleucia, they arrive in Cyprus and all the way from Salamis to Paphos. What they're going to do is this, preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the commission. The word of God. Notice, fourthly, there's a col collaboration that takes place. And we're introduced to a very interesting guy at the end of verse number five. They proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Well, which John is this? Who is this John? Well, it's great to figure out who these people are because it's important to know the role they're going to play. This is not John the Apostle. This is one who was known as John Mark. Uh, later on, in fact, in just a few verses, we're going to find that this is the same John that is going to run. And he's going to desert them. Uh, later on, it's this very John that is going to cause a split or a conflict between Paul and Barnabas. Because Paul is going to get very upset about this very John. This, this guy, John, he left us. He's not going with us again. Barnabas says, of course he's going to go with us. And so Barnabas ends up taking John. Paul, you'll see, will end up taking Titus with him. Oh, sorry, Silas with him. But this John is John Mark. And God has here this man assisting them. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that God places men in our lives, women in our lives, that can co-labor for the cause of the gospel? I have to constantly remind myself 
Anton, watch out when you think you can do it all. Watch out when you're trying to do it all. God has gifted many people that are able to co-labor for the cause of Christ. You may say, well, I'm no Paul. I'm no Barnabas. Barnabas, man, he was the son of encouragement. Barnabas, he was the pastor of pastors. Paul, oh my goodness, who can even begin to think of Paul, a teacher extraordinaire? I'm nothing like that. Well, maybe you forget that God doesn't use the great. He uses the weak. God doesn't need a Paul. God doesn't need the superstar. He is the superstar. He uses whom he uses, when he uses, and how he uses, and it is up to us to be obedient. Could I ask our leaders today, how sensitive are you, church leader, uh, to those that God has placed alongside you to assist you? Are you using them? Are you co-laboring? Collaboration is important when we understand the analogy of the body of Christ. You see, not everybody's a hand, not everybody's a foot, not everybody's an arm or a leg. We are all different, but we have different functions for the same purpose, the edification of the body and the glory of God. The question is not this, what am I? The, the question is this, are you playing your role? Whatever that may be. God may have gifted you as a teacher. Are you teaching? As an administrator, are you administrating? As an encourager, are you encouraging? As a leader, are you leading diligently? What is, how has God gifted you? Be engaged in the work. But whenever God's work is being done, there will always be a conflict. Would you agree with that statement? Satan absolutely hates it when a church is reaching people for Christ. Whenever there is a work going on for the glory of God, Satan will put his foot in it and he will attack the church. And sometimes he does that from the outside. Uh, other times he does that even from the inside within the membership. Oh, we need to be very, very diligent uh, in ensuring that we are all walking in the Spirit. That we would never allow Satan to put a foothold uh, in our lives or, or to uh, cause anything in our lives uh, to be divisive within the body or cause to become a stumbling block to the brothers and sisters, or even more so, a stumbling block to the non-believer. How many times haven't I said it from this podium? We do not sin in isolation. Not one of us are an island unto ourselves. Our sin affects everybody. Our activity, whether it be good or bad, will always affect somebody. Our lack of activity will also have an effect. How I encourage you today to be on mission, engaged in a divine commission given by the divine commissioner. But here comes the conflict, and it all begins with a counterfeit. So verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as, part, as far as Paphos. So when you're looking at the island of Crete, you've got Salamis on the, on the one end. And now they've gone all the way along the end and now they're at Paphos. So they've gone right through the whole island and they've been preaching. They came upon a certain magician. He was a Jewish false prophet. And he was named Bar-Jesus. Let me stop there. 
in, in the, the uh, Hebrew language, you have a lot of composite names. So let's take, for instance, uh, here's, here's a place that you'll know, Bethlehem. Everyone knows about Bethlehem? So Bethlehem comes from a, 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 a composite word. Bet, which means home of. Lechem, which means bread. So it's the house or the home of bread. Bethlehem. Then you'll have Bethphage. And so we go on. But then we also have, when it comes to personal names, uh, there's also composite names. Here's one for you. You will know this name. Barabbas. You remember Barabbas? This is where Jesus was going to be crucified. And they said, do not give us Jesus, but give us Barabbas. Bar Abbas. Bar meaning son of Abba, father. Son of father. Well, isn't that incredible? They're saying, don't give us the son of God. Give us son of father, Barabbas. Well, we know there's another man here, Barnabas, son of encouragement. But now we come to another name, Bar Jesus, son of Jesus. How in the world does that work itself out? Keep it in the back and we'll get to it in a second. He's a counterfeit. Notice the scriptures call him a false prophet. Verse 7, and he is with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, and a man of intelligence. And this man summons Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear. This is what he's wanting to hear. He wants to hear the word of God. That's important. He didn't just want to hear from them. He wants to hear the word of God. Well, you may ask, well, what is it, sir, Sir Just Paulus? What is it that you would ask for the word of God? How do you even know about that? Well, you forget when they arrived, verse 5 says, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues. What was the word on the street? The word on the street was this. These men have got a word from God. And now he's calling them and saying, hey, I hear that there's a word from God, and that's what I want to hear. Oh, may we be, in, may, may we be uh, ready in season and out of season with a word from God. Everybody has their own opinion. Would you agree with that? I bet you if I had to uh, uh, take a, 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 a survey of this room, that has, what, approximately 100 people in here, a little over 110, 120, something like that, uh, I would end up getting at least 500 opinions. Because some of us, and remember I'm including myself now, I'm being kind, some of us are so opinionated that our, we never know what our opinion is from one day to the next. I am so glad that the Word of God never changes. Unlike my opinions and unlike my feelings and, and, and my priorities and, and my perspectives are up and down and up and down. One day it's here and the next day it's there. But God's word never changes. And this is what this man wants to hear. He wants to hear the word of God. But there's a conflict that is about to take place. And it all involves a counterfeit, a false prophet by the name of Bar Jesus. And he is there trying to stop the word of God from going further. He's trying to stop Sergius Paulus, who was a man of great stature, uh, who could have a lot of influence, and he's trying to stop. He's trying to lie. He's being deceptive. Uh, he's adding a little bit of truth and throwing in his own stuff. And, and, and it causes this great conflict Verse 8 says, But Elymas the magician, for that is what the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. A conflict. Satan is always trying to turn people away. Lest we forget that we are engaged in a spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 12 is a very powerful passage and reminder to us today. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. 
listen, this is war. This is war. And this is not a cakewalk. This is not a Sunday school picnic. This is absolute war. We are called to be soldiers of the cross. We are to be fighting the good fight. These are military terms. We are to be guarding the word of God. We are to be guarding the gospel. We are to be the ones who are actively fighting. Listen, there's no place in a foxhole for a believer. We are called to be on the front line. Sometimes it's so evident that you can see the man, you can see what's going on. Here he is, bar Jesus. Here he is, Elymas the magician. Here he is, trying to turn. And we can see, listen, a lot of times the attacks of the evil one come in a way that we don't even see it. Maybe the attitude of a heart. Maybe the motivations of a lost one. Let us never forget, this is war. This counterfeit leads to the conflict. Here's the conflict. Oh, I like this. But, oh, I like Saul. Man, I tell you, he is such a courageous, bold guy. But Saul who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's very important. I want you to underline that in your mind. I'm going to come back to it. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Looked intently at him. Uh, This looking is not just a gazing over, but he looked intently. He looked into him is the idea here. He focused upon him. And I believe it's here that the the Holy Spirit gave the discernment and gave the words that Paul needed to speak. This was not Paul acting out in the flesh. That's why I say, underline, filled with the Holy Spirit. Because what he's about to do is going to sound very harsh. But when you understand who really is speaking here, that this is God addressing him. Not that I'm saying Paul is God, but this is what God has given Paul to say. You will understand the urgency of this mission. Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looks intently at him and said, You bar diabolos. Son of the devil. Wait a minute. Didn't we just speak about Bar Jesus was his name? Not everyone that calls themselves a son of the most high God is a son of God. And Paul calls him exactly what he is. We've seen him being known as Bar Jesus. But here Paul calls him exactly what he is. Bar Diabolos. You, son of the devil, you, enemy of all righteousness, you're full of deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Listen, if there's anything that that, that really puts an emphasis on this passage, it's this, that this man who claimed to be, or his name was Bar Jesus, son of Jesus, his actions, that he was making the straight paths of God crooked, the fact that he was full of villainy, the fact he was full of deceit, the fact that he was against the the gospel, proved for him to be nothing but a counterfeit, he was a false prophet, he was a son of the devil. By their fruit, you shall know them. And here the Holy Spirit gives Paul the insight he needs to enter into the conflict and drill down to the root of the issue. And the root of the issue that he drills down to is not the man's actions, but the man's character. Actions come from character. What's in the heart will come out. You want to know what's in a man's heart? Listen to his mouth. 
Look at his actions. And here, Paul drills down uh, to the character of the man, and the character that he hits on is this, that you're the son of the devil. Well, who is the devil? Well, we know, according to Scripture, that he is the enemy. Here he calls him, you are the enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths? Now notice the curse. And now. It's almost like there's a sense of solemnness to the moment. And Paul says this to him. And now. Behold. Or listen up. The hand of the Lord is upon you. When that phrase is used through the scripture, it's used either that the hand of the Lord is upon you for blessing or the hand of the Lord is upon you for protection. But listen, it's a a terrible thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. It's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. And he says, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. So here I'm going to do some theological gymnastics. It doesn't say this, but I am thinking this. Not only will he not see the sun shining, but he will not see the sun, our Lord Jesus Christ. Immediately. In other words, not, not in a little while, but immediately. Mist and darkness fell upon him. And he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. This is the man who's leading people astray, now seeking people to lead him. And lastly, I close with this, the convert. In verse 12, the convert. Then the proconsul believed. In other words, he placed his trust in Jesus Christ. And you're saying this, Just about scared him into heaven, didn't it? (laughs) No, no. Listen to what the passage says. The proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred. In other words, that was proof of who Paul was. For he was astonished or taken aback or amazed By this wonderful miracle. Is that what it says? He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Not the teaching of Paul. Not the teaching of Barnabas. Not the the, the miracle that had just happened. But he was absolutely astonished, amazed, taken aback about the teaching of the Lord. Hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then seeing this awesome miracle take place as a confirmation of this truth. This man is astonished, amazed, taken aback, and he believes in Jesus Christ, and he's converted, and he enters into the kingdom of God in a flash. And it all began with a commissioner commissioning to the commission with the understanding that there would be a counterfeit waiting, but God sent a co-laborer to work alongside of them, knowing there would be a conflict, but God giving the insight, God pronouncing the curse, and all this for the convert, that he might come to Christ. When I read this last verse, when he saw what had occurred, It got my mind thinking, and that's a dangerous thing. But it kind of got my mind thinking. Wouldn't it be awesome for people to see a miracle like that when they hear the gospel? And then I thought about it. 
when they hear the gospel, they're seeing a miracle. You better be that miracle when you share the gospel. What do you mean? Something I've got to do? No. The reality of what Christ has done in you is the greatest miracle. There is no greater miracle than a changed life. Listen, a, a, a religion that cannot change you cannot save you. And when you share the gospel and people look at you and say, well, I knew him just 10 years ago and oh my goodness, something happened. Oh yes, something happened. It's called the power of God. Uh, it's it called the regeneration. Uh, it, it, it is called God showing up and showing out, exploding the gospel in the heart of a sinful man that he in an instant may become a saint. Not work towards it to become something someday. But in an instant, justified, done. A done deal at the cross. And now by the fruit of that person's life, you can see it has happened. You, my dear brother and sister, you and me, we are walking miracles. Trophies of grace. That when people hear the word of God, it's accompanied with a miracle. And that's the miracle of the regeneration that's taking place in your life. I end with this thought. Where do you stand this morning? Have you drawn close to the divine executor who instigates all true evangelical activities? Do you know this commander-in-chief of the army of Christ? Do you draw near to him so that you might be more intensely, intensely missionary? Or are you just going... With a flow. Dead fish flow downstream. I love to go trout fishing, by the way. If anyone wants to know, I love trout fishing. And if there's something I've learned, the fish never face downstream. They always face upstream. And whenever you cast, you always cast upstream. So the bait runs down so they might see it and take it. Well, why are they facing upstream? It's got something to do with gills. It's got something to do with breathing. Christian, swim upstream. Don't be a dead fish. Get in the game. You have a commissioner. He's divine. And he said that all authority in heaven and earth and below the earth have been given to him. Therefore go and make disciples. And baptize them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. When the one who has all authority speaks into your life and calls you to a divine mission, how can you say no? How can you say no? And the great thing is he said, and lo, I will be with you to the very end of the age. Called to missions. Called to live a life where we're absolutely engaged, not disengaged. Swimming upstream, not floating downhill. Called to make a difference for Christ. Would you? Well, I don't know how to begin. Begins with your own family. Begins with your next door neighbor. It begins with this one thing. Yes, Lord. Get your butt out of the way and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
reckless abandonment to the Lordship of Christ. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And he will use you in ways that you couldn't even begin to imagine if you will just say, yes, Lord. Would you stand as we closed? As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I, I want to give you an opportunity. Is there someone here? You've been called to, to the mission field to go out and it may be a short-term mission. Maybe it's to go to... Uh, West Virginia with our team that will be leaving now just uh, in a month's time. In fact, just a little over a month, they'll be leaving for West Virginia. And you need to say, yes, Lord, I'm going. Or, or maybe you want to engage in missions and say, you know what? I want to be a part of the outreach to our local school. I, I want to be a, a part of the outreach in the soup kitchen that we've got going here at the association. Or, or maybe you want to say, I want to be a part of the ladies' ministry. Uh, maybe... I, Lord, whatever it is, or maybe the, the Lord is saying, you know that I've set you apart. Listen, I didn't call you to be mediocre. I, I have called you and I've set you apart. And it may mean you lose everything in this life, but listen, it's all worth it. It is absolutely worth it. This altar's open right now. What has God said to you? Will you come and make a commitment to Him this morning? You be obedient to whatever the Lord has told you and you'll be fine when you leave here. You do that. So how is the Lord leading you this morning? What has He called you to? I know He's called us all to be on mission. What is He calling you to today? Maybe there's even one in this room. This gospel. That Jesus Christ died as the atoning sacrifice for you. He lived the life you couldn't live and He died the death that you couldn't die. And He's called you into his kingdom. And he's called you to repent, to turn from yourself and give your life to Jesus. Maybe there's one in this room, you've never surrendered to Christ. And today's the day that you say, here I am, Lord. I give my life to you. Would you come? It's flight to rest.
Just my song through endless dangers. Jesus led me all the way. You lead me and keep me from falling. You carry me close to your heart. Surely, your goodness and mercy will follow me. Will follow me. Father, we are grateful for the time that we've been able to spend as brothers and sisters worshipping you. Lord, I pray that our time in worship today, whether it's been in prayer, whether it's been in song or the preaching of your word or the response to your word, that it was well-pleasing to you. But again, we desire that your Holy Spirit would continue to lead us and guide us. We as a church would not just be going through the motions, but God, that we would be a church that's on mission for you. We want to see this world turned upside down. God, we want to see you doing a work that only you can do in a way that only you can do. Lord, that no one can take credit for it or even explain it away. God, that people might see what an awesome, supreme and preeminent God you are. So be glorified in our individual lives. Be glorified in the corporate life of this church. Lord, use us for your glory. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.